Welcome everyone. Hi, thanks for saying hi in the chat. My name is Marianne Fitzgerald. I am the Director of Information Democracy uh, at the Open Society Foundation. Uh, that means that I'm in charge of journalism and tech broadly. Um, I used to be the Editor-in-Chief of Open Democracy, the fine global media organization that is convening this chat today. Um, we have a fascinating panel today. Thank you so much for joining us. We have Nikki Usher, who's among many other things, the author of News for the Rich, White and Blue, How Place and Power Distort American Journalism. We also have Jonathan Hayward, who is, the, is now the Executive Director of the Public Interest News Foundation. We're gonna be hearing more about that. And we have Open Democracy's brilliant new editor-in-chief, Peter Gagan. So um, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, please feel free to participate. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions ahead of time. Um, we'll be trying to get to as many of those as possible. And um, please, if questions occur to you or comments occur to you, you can put them in the chat. You can use um, the, the question um, function, the Q&A function on Zoom, or if you're joining us in Facebook live stream, um, you can feed questions in there and they'll be fed, um, fed back to me. So uh, I wanted to start with Nikki. Nikki, you've written this book, which is the provocation for today's discussion. Um, and I think the, the title really says it all, right? News for the rich, white and blue. Um, what's going wrong? What's, what is, how is place and power distorting American journalism? Tell us, the, tell us the, bring us the, the picture from the other yeah. side. Well, thank you for that. Thanks for having me here. I'm so glad to be with so many people. Um, so I guess the, the real thing that I see happening is that uh, American journalism, and I think journalism in, in the UK to some extent as well, um, is no longer commercially sustainable, uh, apart from basically users paying for news. And um, what that ends up doing is distorting even more than it's already been who the news is for and who the news is by, right? Because to be, want to be part of this extremely precarious industry requires feeling like you've got a backup plan. And in the US, the blue part comes out of the fact, not so much that I want to, to call newsrooms liberal, but I think that we need to recognize that the only Americans that are paying attention to the institutional news media and believe that it is true and real are at this point liberals. And so we're in this really difficult situation where the only news organizations that I think are likely to survive are large national and international news organizations that will be increasingly detached from places that they are not familiar with, either geographically or culturally. So that's that's the kind of cornerstone. Thank you. And um, I'm obviously interested in this because I've just taken a job working in philanthropy, but there's been a lot of money, a lot of philanthropic money pouring into journalism in the US, um, mm -hmm. staggering amounts by, by British comparisons. And you would think that that would be addressing the problem, right? That would be that would be trying to solve some of these problems, but it has some distorting effects of itself or un unintended consequences as well, right? Yeah, what I ended up doing is I was really interested in whether philanthropy Maybe, maybe this is the solution, right? Um, the problem is, is when you just look at the dollar to dollar amount, um, I think it's something like $1.7 billion were brought in for philanthropy. Is it 1.6? What is it? Jonathan's check. All right, I won't, I, won't, I won't go numbers then. What I'll say more generally is we looked at the flows of philanthropic dollars for investigative journalism. And we were really curious, like, is this actually reinscribing re existing hierarchies when it comes to places that already have lots of news, um, places that might be more politically liberal? Um, there's a problem in philanthropy more generally, like a pack philanthropy where the philanthropists all decide they're gonna give to you know, one particular organization, you start to see that. So we track the flows of investigative money for investigative journalism specifically, because to me, that is the most commercially unviable form of journalism, um, right? Not well supported by the market, not an efficient use of, you know, right? Um, and what we found is really that the journalism is flowing to bluer places. It is flowing to big cities and it's not necessarily flowing to places where there really is a need for news. And in fact, with two case studies, I show that um, one of the issues is that a lot of these funders are urban and the needs in more rural places are different. And that can create an upward barrier for places that have even less viable commercial markets for journalism to make a claim for some of those dollars. 
Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I suppose one of the things I, we're going to come back to the problem, um, uh, but we're going to we're going to jump over to the other side of the Atlantic now because there are so many interesting and rich parallels there. And, and Jonathan has has reviewed your your book, and, and Anita will put his review in the chat because I think that there's there's a really rich conversation to be had and lots of parallels to be drawn. Um, but I want to go very granular now, and I want to go to Peter because. Um, there's two things I wanted to ask you about, Peter. I mean, first of all, Peter, before, before he joined Open Democracy, um, God love him, uh, he and a number of, of journalism colleagues um, tried to set up a local um, investigative journalism outfit. And I'd love you, Peter, just to walk us through that, why you did that, you know, how you did that. Was it hard? Was it easy? <laughs> what were the results? Um, and then we'll talk a bit about some other, other collaborations you've done, which kind of paint the picture of how challenging some of this stuff is. I think it's really interesting. So I think you know like the kind of concept which you know I think Nikki elucidates as well this idea of a kind of news deserts and this idea where the spaces in which there used to be a lot of news. And I'm really struck by you know I spent time in the states. You go to cities that used to have have big metropolitan newspapers, cities like, you know, Baltimore, even Chicago, Cincinnati, loads of cities would have big city, big kind of uh, metro newspapers. And I was in Scotland, I lived in Scotland for many years. Um, and in some ways, Scotland has a similar story, actually. We used to have quite a large, vibrant media in Scotland, um, a lot of Scottish titles, you know, and then over the decades, as, as newspapers, particularly I think similar thing happened in America, that large newspaper groups started buying up Scottish titles. Um, Gannett were the big ones, News Quest, who own a lot of US, they bought the Herald. The Scotsman was bought by Johnston Press. And at the same time, Scottish readers started reading more and more um, kind of London-based titles that would have kind of Scottish, some Scottish content, but smaller amounts of it. So basically, I'm just going to set in the scene for what happened over the last kind of 15 years in Scotland was a real shrinking of investigative journalism, which is the kind of journalism I, I've done a lot for a long time and a kind of a real kind of move towards you know quite cheap content you know cheap and cheap news um and cheap features in many respects too and so about 10 years ago actually it started really myself and some of my colleagues uh with friends we were free, mainly freelancers started off actually from a shared love of freedom of information which is something i've taken on to continue with open democracy but we started talking about uh, what's what what's the potential for doing something around this is there any space in which we could try and plug some of these gaps around investigative journalists and some of the journalists i was working with were really experienced investigative journalists 30 years experience worked for all the major titles but they got to the stage where basically major titles are paying them not enough money to be able to do the work they want to do so we came together and we formed a cooperative called The Ferret, uh, which launched, it had its sixth birthday recently. So, um, and I'm delighted I stood down as chair in the summer. We've now got, we've still got, we've got three members of staff, which is not bad for, for a kind of small local media uh, enterprise. And what we do and what The Ferret does is all about trying to do investigative stories about Scotland, do off diary content, do original news. But suffice to say, it's, you know, it, I remember when we set it up, we actually set it up initially, we just tried to crowdfund one investigation to see if this was possible because a lot of my friends in the media time were like, this is ridiculous, you can't do this. And in some ways, you couldn't base on, on expectations. You know, people, if you were on a salary of £50,000, this was never going to work. And in some ways, there's a difficulty as well, I'm sure, you know, Nikki and John could speak to it too, of, of trying to set up new models based on old ways of doing things as well and, and the real challenge with that. Um, but anyway, we started off, we managed to crowdfund our first investigation. We asked for something like £3,000, we got £10,000, we were started. Part of what we were doing as well was trying to think about changing the media so it was a it's a cooperative so everyone who joins has an equal ownership and equal uh, stake in the organization you know it, it made for you know it's a very very flat structure and you're trying in some ways to try and think about different ownership models i cannot say it's not without challenges if you think you can wander off and set up your own cooperative you know that's very difficult too but the other thing that's kind of important to note as well is we initially started off um, in some ways in the exact opposite place to open democracy where, where i now work um uh um where we started off purely from a reader funded model and open democracy is kind of purely from a, a grant funded model and in some ways the ferret and open democracy are trying to meet each other we're trying to find ways to be sustainable using the two but the challenge for something like the ferret uh, for a lot of local news outlets is is that one of sustainability and of trying to find you know we've we have had some grant funding but it's now disappearing because the big grant funder is pulled out and so we're not, it doesn't mean the project is going to end, but we're going to have to realign ourselves. So it's a real challenge when it comes to like building up. And we've, the Ferret's had great successes. It's won media awards. It's broken big stories. It's been all the major newspapers. The BBC has covered its stories. It's worked with the BBC, but it is a real challenge. And it's that kind of thing as well, I think, of the aspects of paying for news. And in similar, you know, I think, some of the things that Nikki's talking about, we, to be honest, you can see with almost every project I've been involved with, which is that metropolitan areas 
or where the supporter base is. You know, it does pull you towards metropolitan areas to support certain types of stories. So it's it is an interesting, you know, having gone through the the difficulties with 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 what is kind of a local news outlet trying to fill a very specific need around investigative journalism where there is a clearly defined need. It still is, you know, in terms of bringing audience with us. We've had some great successes at the fair, but you know, it, huge amounts of sweat equity going into cooperative. Well, well, indeed, also, and but a thing that we should make visible here is a lot of that is voluntary time. I mean, for the start, it was all voluntary time, and that now it still is a lot of voluntary time. And so it's not, you know, hence urban elite already employed <laughs> people are doing this work, right? And um, I, I think that, that that's another thing which kind of perpetuates the thing uh, that Nikki was talking about. I'll come back to, to some of the collaborations um, that Open Democracy have done uh, actually later, because I, I wanted to bring Jonathan in here. And, and Jonathan, I mean, first of all, it'd be good for you to tell us a bit about what the Public Interest News Foundation is seeking to do and the problem it's trying to solve, because I think in many ways this relates to exactly what we've just been talking about. Thanks, Mary. Um, thanks all. It's very nice to be here with Open Democracy, sort of slightly celebrating your 20th anniversary, I think, still. Um, what is the Public Interest News Foundation trying to do? I guess... We're trying to be a good ally to those independent publishers and journalists who are trying to be part of the solution. So, you know, in the UK, there is, I think, the beginnings of a new, you know, to be grand about it, maybe even a new era, let's say a new era in more diverse, more plural, more high standards, more accountable journal public interest journalism. You know, there's loads of things that have gone wrong with the media economy over the last 20 years social media has blown up old business models but there are loads of things that have gone right as well you know social media has blown up old business models and it has blown up old models of journalism and many of the things that nikki rightly emphasizes in the book are that some of those old models were deeply flawed and yes there were local newspapers or many of them in every town in the us and every town in the uk but they were all run by white men and they all privileged certain voices and certain perspectives and certain issues. And social media has, has just shown us all that we live in complicated, diverse, plural societies with people with every kind of background and every kind of belief and opinion and a news media that pretends that we're kind of homogenous and we fit into certain boxes is not capable of being trusted anymore. Now, that's problematic because there are also good things about some of the old media standards of verification and, and fact checking and so on. So it seems to me like the challenge and the opportunity is to get the best of the old and the best of the new and wrestle them together into new forms of media that are genuinely connected to people's lived experiences, whoever and, you know, wherever they are. But hanging on to some of those, I think, still really important journalistic values of, of verifying and, and, and tr you know, trying to follow some intellectual epistemic standards to make sure that the stories that you're telling are not only relevant and topical and timely, but are also sort of grounded in some kind of shared reality. And it's the beginnings. So in the UK, as in the US, we have got open democracy, we have got the ferret, we have got the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, we have got the Bristol Cable, we've got many people on this call, I can see joining us in the chat who run independent news publications across the UK. You know, we think there may be up to 400 open democracy and the ferret and the cable and others are, the, are at the top of the tree, to be fair, in terms of size and impact. But there's a lot out there going down to really quite a small grassroots level, but most of it really fragile. So just quickly to draw the comparison between the UK and the US, we did this thing this year. Um, we, we ran a kind of survey of the sector modelled on a, on a survey that's been running in the US for the last five years called the INN index. So we took that index methodology and ran it in the UK to draw some benchmark Data. So in the US, nonprofit newsrooms typically have turnover of hundreds of thousands of dollars, in many cases, millions of dollars. In the UK, they typically have turnover of 40,000 pounds. So, you know, about $55,000. Many have much lower than that. And there are some biases in the sector. So this is even amongst these kind of nonprofit, independent, values driven people who are trying to fill deficits it's much harder to make it pay at a local level. 
So they typically have turnover of £20,000, and it's much harder to do investigative. So the, the big comparison we drew is that in the States where there is that philanthropic money, yes, it has got biases, and yes, maybe it's piling resources into places that are already comparatively resource rich. But as a comparison to the UK, it is enabling a lot of investigative journalism. So I think in the in in the, in the US, um, the uh, you know a third to a half of nonprofit newsrooms will be doing a high degree of investigative reporting. In the UK, it's something like seven percent. I mean, there are, there are exceptions and they're on the screen in front of us, but the vast majority simply don't have the result. It's 20,000 pounds a year. You can't run investigations. You're, you're working really hard just to sort of stand still and do the sort of general news reporting. And you're much more likely to be dependent on advertising, particularly programmatic advertising, which militates towards trying to do stories that appeal to the greatest number of people and, and work on, on, on social Etc. So there's there is a there's, there's there's potential. You know there is the seed. There are people out there, media pioneers, trying to be the change. But the economy, as it's currently structured in this country, is not giving them the best the best chance. And I think Nikki is pointing out some really important correctives to what's happening in the states. But I also have to say, I still look across the Atlantic with like big green eyes of envy at the opportunities that you've got going on. And it is a question of, of who it's reaching. So you make a very good point about supply there, Jonathan. Like there's way more public interest in rescue journalism going on in the US, a lot more money funding it. But who it's reaching um, is a really critical part of this. I mean, I will I, I do have to point out this is unusually for open democracy, an all-white panel we're having in this discussion, which is just a signal of how much work there is to do. And as I say, this is more unusual for open democracy to be in this position, but we also have to name it, right? Um, and I think that uh, the, to your point about um, audience and audi audience distribution or audience distribution methods, Nikki, there's still so much work to be done, but I wanna hear more from you on, um, on potential solutions. And I actually, I also want to flag one other thing, which is that some of my Open Society Foundation colleagues, when they saw the title of this, um, of this discussion reacted in horror. They were like, oh, journalism is on its knees. Why are we asking whether it's failing democracy? Does it have to do that as well? Does it have to prop up democracy? <laughs> and oh. I think that it's really funny because we had, yeah, we, we laughed about that because we were like, oh, if it survives then it's done something very important and it might be serving democracy in some way. Um, but, um, but obviously, I mean, we can get into, into, into how journalism can better serve democracy and talk about those distribution methods and challenges. But Nikki, I'd love you to talk through, because you, you have some really bold and challenging ideas for what we need to do, and I'd love to hear, hear those. Well, I mean, I, I wanna sort of just clarify first that I, I, I'm pro-democracy, and, and I do think that one of the myths that ties, like, you know, that belief in democratic civilization together is the belief in a free press. And so I, but I think that, and that myth, without that myth, we see what's happening without that myth, right? We see people turning away, not just from journalism as an institution, but other institutions as well. So it's a, it's a foundational ideological myth that we need to buy into. Right. And, and so I want to just kind of make that really clear that I'm not trying to to knock that down. What I'm trying to remind people is whose democracy do we invoke when we use that word democracy? And for too long, that version of democracy has been really flat. You know, it's been a democracy for some and not a democracy for all. Right. And that's the whole point. And my worry is that given the current political economy of the news media, that the people who end up being most able to participate in that democracy with the best knowledge possible are going to be members of the elite. And so you end up having an elite democracy where elites check elites. And that leads to all sorts of distortions, right? So I just want to be really clear that that myth is really important. But we need to continue to create critique whether that myth like the power of that myth and whether it's relevant. So I just wanted to, to do take care of that first. Um, did you want me to try to solve all the problems now too? Because I can try that. But <laughs> <laughs> well, your book, your book lays out, and then there's some meaty discussion we can have about some of the things that you talk about. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear um, what, what you think some of the, um, the ways that we need to think about things differently and what some of the potential solutions are. 
um, at least in the U.S. context, and then we can draw draw that out. Yeah, I mean, I think in the U.S. context, we do have to acknowledge that philanthropy is going to be, you have to sort of think about it as a pillar, pillar strategy, right? So one pillar is going to be public media, right, which is we don't have a very strong sector here in the U.S. Um, one of the problems we have with public media in the U.S. is it's often tied to universities. And when universities want to clamp down on coverage, they can come up with something. And I'm currently thinking a lot around that. Something that we don't do enough in the US is we don't acknowledge that we have a partisan media system. We kind of pretend that we don't. And it's really funny that we don't. And um, to me, I mean, I really do believe that responsibly done partisan journalism as it is practiced in your country, um, <laughs> can can write that, that giving people a sense of where you stand is intellectually honest. And it's, interesting right it's interesting to know whose team you're on and who's right and so um i think that that is promising i think that i don't really believe that the commercial model is sustainable for a lot of places at the local level and so one intervention that i've been pushing and i don't think it's going to happen but it's possible is i'd like to actually see political parties begin funding original news gathering at the local level and if you want to say it's not happening it is it's happening on the right it's not happening on the left so just thinking about the redistribution of money in politics to create political knowledge is sort of something I'd really like to see. Um, and then I think the other thing just to kind of pertinent to this conversation is really thinking, what is it that professional journalists do better than anybody else, right? What is the special, you know, professional journalists can offer a good that nobody else can do, a labor that nobody else can do, right? People can record. We, we just had a Pulitzer, um, uh, what is it, C accreditation uh, to the woman who shot, who, who videoed the George Floyd, right? Um, so, so people can capture events and school boards can put out meeting notes, right? But what is it that journalists do that's a special function, right? And I think that investigative journalism is bar none the thing that sets journalists apart. And so just this idea that journalists have to cover everything and know everything, I think is, is really undermining, right? What journalists with their scarce resources should be focusing on is most democratically important given what they do best. And so that's kind of my, that's a little bit of some of that, I think that, that I'd like to get out there. Thank you. I mean, I'm going to come back to the objectivity or partisanship point in a moment. But I mean, one of the things that Peter and I and many on the rest of us on our team have been grateful for for many years of working together is that we don't have to cover all the news all the time every day. <laughs> and that's what allows us to, to dive deep on issues that newspapers just don't have the capacity to follow and really, really dig down on. Um, I wanted to know, Peter, if you could say any more about that, just where you found it a real luxury and privilege and honor um, to be to be able to to do those deep dives um, in ways that many organizations don't don't and can't and i will it's not my job anymore but i will definitely plug open democracy here and say you should support them they're great it's only possible because of people like you watching this so go ahead peter <laughs> I think that is really true. You know, I think Nikki's point about investigative journalism is the one is the place where journalists can see, you can shine a light, you can see where, where the difference is. I think that in some ways has, has you know, has long been the case, really. I don't think that's a new thing that investigative journalism is a new thing. You know, it's but the difference is the model that sustained it. Like the Sunday Times Insight team, which re revealed the thalidomide scandal in the 60s, was paid for by ads on behind the Chinese wall, frankly. You know, and you had these journalists doing this thing, you know, and, and in some ways that Chinese wall has really crumbled as well just as an aside and you know it's really striking actually the first big thing I ever remember reading in Open Democracy actually was Peter Oborn's piece when he left the Telegraph a big UK newspaper because they had been spiking critical stories about a big uh, a big advertiser H, uh, H, it was HSBC and so that was a huge you know that it kind of shows that kind of seismic change as well I think that tension between both sides of the house has become much more extreme in traditional news outlets but yeah I do agree I think that the kind of aspect of investigations and the way in which like I think there's a pub the public good aspect of it and the public good aspect of and the kind of greater public good of it the idea that 
you know, if open democracy reveals something, it isn't just about open democracy, it isn't just about our readers, it puts something into the public domain. You know, for example, there's a parliamentary committee just starting in Britain looking at a secret of FOI clearinghouse, freedom information clearinghouse existing in the middle of government. That's a direct result of open democracy investigations. Our readers paid for it, our readers supported it, but you know, it's it's gone way beyond that, and that's that's the value. That's the you know, that's the uh, huge. Without getting a cliche about it, the added value uh, mm-hmm. of of or it's on like management speak of investigative journalism. But the same side, there is the huge challenge of it, which is the sustaining and supporting of it, and doing it in a way that can like because you do need a healthy a reasonably healthy media ecosystem for that to work as well you know these stories have to this to move from investigative outlets into other outlets for that chain to happen you know i remember someone saying to me you know like once you know like i i, I you know i remember saying to me once I, I i wouldn't want someone to only get their news from the places i write for you know there's a value to telling news as well the problem is there's a kind of we've lost the balance, you know, more and more, as you as Jonathan rightly points out, a lot of not just small news sites, even a kind of larger news outlets as well are chasing clicks, chasing programmatic advertising, chasing and that leads you down a kind of crowd tangle journalism. For those who don't know what crowd tangle is, it's Facebook's lovely thing that lets you find out what's trending where. <laughs> and it's becoming clearly a way in which news sites are, 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 are doing content, you know, hence the fact that you see so many headlines for the exact same story, you know, re- repeated across places. So there's there's a seismic, there's a kind of fundamental problem in it. Um, you know, obviously from a personal perspective, being able to do investigations and being able to feed those in, you know, it's 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 a huge privilege, but to be aware of the constraints that are existing across the industry and getting that, letting that happen in, in a wider way is, is huge. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to note what someone said in the chat here, which is um, that journalism has always been a highly contested arena. And I mean, yes, there have always been proprietors who have agendas. There have always been advertisers who, who lean on, on their um, on their clients to publish favorable things. Um, the press barons, it was ever that the like, capture or potential capture or attempted capture of media has always happened. It's an age old problem. Um, so I, don't, I think all of us are very, very aware of that. And what we're talking about today is, is really the, just the new, the new forms that this exercise or abuse of um, or show of power um, manifest itself. Um, yeah, Jonathan, I wanted to come to you now as well, because you, in your piece on open democracy, um, beg to differ with, differ with Nikki a little bit on um, that question of objectivity. And I mean, it, I've always actually been of more of the perspective that you should uh, obviously report the news as um, it, it should be fact-based. Um, if you're, if you're re- revealing an investigation, you should leave with what the story is. But but as journalists, we all have inbuilt biases and actually being more transparent and open about them is, is actually more authentic and, and credible um, and, and does the public a service. But yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll try, but I have to be honest, it's really complicated. And you know, I think Nikki is right to invite us or even you know, force us to think about some of this stuff. If you have a country like the US where half of the political population just has completely abandoned all ties with institutional media, you know, you've got to think about what the hell is going on there. And we have similar issues in this country and it's common across Europe and other, you know, other advanced, as it were, democracies. So, you know, so what I, th- I think the idea that we that we're certainly more upfront about the fact that objectivity is an impossible dream. Yes, I think it's an impossible. There is you know, I don't think there is one story like there's the world and I'm now going to describe the world in 600 words in a way that is incontrovertible. You know, that's not plausible. The world is infinitely complex and we see it through 7 billion different pairs of eyes every day. There are no words conceivable that are going to be everything to everyone. At the same time, I think it's really important that we are able to live in some kind of shared reality. I think, you know, in the States, in the UK, whatever, wherever we live, we need, needs to be some degree of acceptance that some things... It may not be binary, it may not be true or false, objective or subjective, but I think there are degrees of of, of, of attempting to engage with a kind of shared reality and to build a shared shared picture. So I've I've spent some time the last few years really trying to think about this and talking to philosophers, which sort of drives you a bit mad at times, (laughs) and they ask these really stupid questions like, but how do you know that's true? And, you know, where are your biases? And why are you asking that question? And, you know... But one of the things that that's 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 brought me 
face to face with is the idea that um, that we might want to think about this not in terms of an absolute on off switch true false subjective subjective but in terms of the kinds of behaviors which are more likely to point us in a sort of truthy direction so things like intellectual curiosity intellectual courage you know being prepared to challenge one's own assumptions being honest about one's own assumptions attending to what the other side thinks and trying to really listen and respect that i find that really helpful so i suppose what i would um, love to see would be that you could have media that was very upfront yeah my i'm rooted in a kind of internationalist socialist worldview here's my media that will inform the choice of stories it means i'm going to pick up on certain things that are a right wing nationalist outlet is simply not going to pick up on that it's not going to be on their agenda you know our agendas are going to be different so the values will inform the selection of stories it may inform the framing of stories you know the headlines what goes first how you know how we sort of organize the the, the facts but at the level of facts i would like there to be that common commitment whether it's right left nationalist internationalist uh traditionalist avant-garde you know to some idea that we're all we're, you know we're going to be equally curious and we're going to be equally self-challenging and if we come up against facts that really don't suit our worldview we have to be honest and open about that not do the what i would call the fox approach which is you know ignore or traduce the inconvenient facts and the people who bring them to your attention i mean that way to me I can't exactly point out there in the world and say this is what it looks like. So I'm not quite sure. You know, you might say the Guardian's a good example of that, but someone will come and tell you it's not. Um, but I think I think I think say I think some some common intellectual standards of curiosity, courage, being prepared to challenge yourself, being prepared to listen seriously in good faith to what the other side has to say, balanced with being upfront about your values, to me, maybe takes you. In the right direction. Thank you. Yeah, at Open Democracy, we often say we are plural but not neutral. So um, we we are pluralist. We value different opinion, opinions, perspectives, and we host them. But we call out injustice. We call out imbalances of power. We call out abuse of power. We're not neutral observers of of those um, things. So once we have this um, uh, open, honest, authentic. Um, media system that, that Jonathan's talking about. Well, indeed, in, in, in the getting there, there are so many new efforts and initiatives underway. Um, and many of them are in the US, but many of them are global as well. So there's talk about digital tax on um, platforms, um, tax incentives um, for, for supporting journalism. Um, that, that, and then um, internationally as well, the um, uh, there's an initiative underway called the uh, IFPIM, which is the um, International Fund for Public Interest Media, which is aiming to leverage um, government's um, development and aid budgets to support more, more independent journalism in the global south. There's just tons of stuff going on. Nikki, what, what, do, you, what do you rate? <laughs> what do you think has a chance of working? What do you think we should be paying attention to and supporting? And what do you think is hopeless? <laughs> um, so I think it's hopeless to talk about you know, I mean, platforms really give me a sense of hopelessness because I, I think about just, they're such a distribution portal for so much news and information. Um, but on the other hand, I think that um, it's actually the solution and a really important part of it. The reason, um, you know, these platforms like Facebook, Facebook goes out and the entire, you know, 3.5 billion people, more people than actually are Christian in the world, right, are on Facebook. And I think that these, companies that are too big to fail are undermining independent media. And we need to sort of use the tools of antitrust. And we've seen that happen in the EU. We're seeing some really good actions in the EU. What ends up happening is that Google and Facebook come in with a whole bunch of money and they say, here, here you go, guys. And then, and then it chills. It chills whatever happens. And we see this happen over and over. It's like cyclical. Um, and, and so I just think we need really meaningful, like, breaking up the too big to fail. And the other anecdote, and it doesn't seem like it relates to journalism, but it does, which is better data privacy. Um, GDPR is a bit of a problem in the States because 
it actually, it's just, it's a problem for us um, and how we get our content to the rest of the world. The, the protocols create some difficulties, but um, you know, there are places I know in the EU that have really restricted programmatic advertising based on private data. And so if we can sort of eliminate the chokehold that big tech has on, on private data, which allows them to be better than any news organization could ever be, I think that we start to make space for independent media. And I think that most people want data privacy, right? It's a compelling thing. And most people don't think Facebook should be so big. So I think those to me are, are really promising in terms of fixing just the entire ecology of, of media and tech and all of that. So. <laughs> Well, I mean, this week, the Senate hearings and the Facebook whistleblower is just another moment, but I feel like we're kind of inured to it now as well. It's just, it's kind of what's expected of, of platforms. Um, yeah. Um, I wanted to go um, a bit more granular again, because I feel as though, while I think that the conversations about what journalism is and can should be, um, have been really useful in the sort of value of investigative journalism and the ways that it needs to be supported and the ways that power structures need to change are all really fascinating. But I also do feel like there is still a sort of gatekeeper or gatekeeper element to journalism and media, which we need to unpack a bit, like who is a journalist, what is a journalist? There's fascinating conversations going on in the EU not right now for some of the Business Services Act, um, where publishers, European publishers are arguing that they should be exempt from content moderation, Facebook and, and, and the other big platforms because they're doing journalism. But as soon as you get into the question of who is doing journalism, who gets to decide who is doing journalism, the whole thing falls apart. Right, there are, you know, there are journalism organizations registered and, and regulated in Hungary, for example, that are doing nothing of the sort. They're doing political propaganda. And, um, you know, just as soon as you get into the question of, of who is and who isn't, to your point about the Pulitzer winner who took a photo um, during the George Floyd protests, you're getting into very uncomfortable power dynamics and very, very uncomfortable gatekeep gatekeeperism. And while uh, democracy we have high standards when it comes to journalism, um, many of our most important stories have come, have come from partners, activists, on the ground, who spot things that don't get spotted in, the reg in regular newsrooms, right, in, in, in regular media outlets. And many of the best journalism has been done by people who are very entry level, have just recently um, joined us as, as trainees and, and have gone on to be um, nominated for prizes and, and done really fascinating work because very often they have lived experience and perspective that allows us to spot, uh, allows us to spot the stories that others, others wouldn't. And there's a really great example of this. I might get Anita to share it in the chat because it's one of the things I think Peter and I are most proud of that democracy's done, um, where we did a big story, uh, which involved very traditional journalism, led by our amazing colleague, Claire, Claire Provo, and her brilliant um, team, tracking the backslash team. But they looked at um, a number of IRS filings, so of, of, of religious conservative organizations in the US, and they looked at the way they've been, been spending money overseas. And they noticed that a particular organization called Heartbeat International, that's a pioneer of a model that is quite well known in the US, but not outside of the US, which is the Crisis Pregnancy Center, where um, women who are facing crisis pregnancies go to what they think is a neutral health facility for advice. It's actually run by anti abortion activists. They've heard lots of misinformation about their health and their rights. But Claire and her team noticed that this was actually, they were spending a lot of money overseas. And they discovered that they were training and funding um, a large network of so-called crisis pregnancy centers all over the world. They found more than 400 in Italy, they found them across five continents. Um, and then they sent undercover reporters in there to find out what was going on. And it was terrifying what was going on. It was even worse than what's going on in the US in many ways. It was even more unregulated um, and under the radar. And women were told all kinds of appalling things like, abortion causes cancer, you won't love your other children if you have an abortion, etc, etc, really just absolute horrifying military thing that were being said to women and girls. And I really believe that if, although we had great data journalism expertise on that team, that it was the network um, that this team of journalists had built with organisations on the ground, um, the, and, and with, with activists and, and, and local journalists and local people, right, that had, that had surfaced this story that wouldn't have been surfaced and wasn't indeed surfaced by um, any other uh, news outlets or, or organizations. And so I think the question of who is doing the journalism 
and what your lived experience and perspective is and where you come from is all really, really, really important. Um, and yeah, I wondered, I, any of the panel can respond to that. I mean, I just wanted to sort of put that out there. That's a really, really important part of the picture. So please, anyone can come, who wants to can come in on that. <laughs> Everyone on YouTube. We all do. We've all got something to say on this, I <laughs> guess. Okay, then Peter, then Jonathan, go first. Please. I mean, I think that what you're saying, right, there's some underlying value that, you know, people shouldn't be deceived when they are making decisions about whether to terminate a pregnancy is, is a value you're going into. And you're, you're, and so I think that that, you know, we recognizing that that's the starting point, I think is, is really important, right? And I think that uh, Jonathan did such a great job, actually, of talking about how I would reform objectivity, like the way we think about objectivity, acknowledge the starting point, acknowledge the limitations of, you know, what you can and cannot see, and then, you know, chase after whatever is there. The problem is, is that there's a tricky journalistic way that we tend to, val to, to verify things, and it's to go to other institutions, and then to take the words of those institutions as verification for ourselves. And so I think, um, you know, this is not exactly directly to your point about worldview, but um, when you get the police, right, for so long, student journalists are trained to just go to the police and get the press report. And that gets like fed in as the authoritative account of what happened. And thankfully, we are now much more aware in the state that, that is not often the case, right? So, so how we do that process of verification is I think really going to be the hang up, the tricky spot in all of this. But I completely agree with you, Mary, that, and, and Jonathan, that, that knowing where you're from gives you access and acknowledging it gives you access to stories that you wouldn't otherwise do. Yeah, absolutely. What you just said reminded me so much of being in the US uh, late last year, just before the election and speaking, spending a lot of time um, with Brianna Taylor activists in, in Louisville, Kentucky, and the yawning gap between uh, the official version of what happened there, but also the, the way that um, big outlets like the New York Times covered that story through their normal verification methods and their normal sources in the, in the, in the justice system, right? Compared with what's now transpiring, um, uh, even after there was an official investigation, even, even after big outlets like the New York Times uh, looked into it, is, is pretty stark. But um, yeah, with that reflection, Peter, what did you want to say? Well, I guess I kind of bouncing off that a little bit as well is, is worth recognizing, you know, when it comes to like gatekeepers and what is a journalist and what isn't, you know, it is worth remembering, like, and think, especially from a UK context, I was struck Nikki, you said earlier about like, you know, it's, and we'd like it to be like in the US, paraphrasing you, where in the UK, we like the US, we want like the UK, where you know, everyone has their, you know, everyone acknowledges their biases, you know, but we were in a post, you know, we were in a post Leveson era here in Britain. What I mean by that is it was a huge phone hacking scandal in the middle of Fleet Street that happened 10, 12 years ago. Well, happened for a very long time before that and possibly even afterwards too, which contributes to a huge part of the erosion of public trust. You know, we, we know for a fact that journalists hacked into a phone of a dead schoolgirl that led their parent, her parents to believe that she was alive for longer because she was checking her messages. And it is important, I think, as well, you know, much as I will defend my industry and my profession, and I probably do see it as a profession, I've done it for a long time, I do it for a job, it pays my, you know, it pays for my my, uh, my spare room. But it is important, I think, as well, to be aware of, of that, that reality as well when it comes to what we might call professional journalism, as well as the extension, I think, it is important to realise like how the flexibility of this term, as you say, Mary, how it's kind of, you know, there's a necessity on some level for for things like unions and stuff to protect what might be designated as a journalist but what we mo a lot of people would see and understand as the role of a journalist you know has a lot of things that are in common with what people do in their everyday lives they capture video they capture user generated content they upload it onto the internet they share it with their friends they might have lots of followers you know i think there's a kind of there is an interesting tension in all this and probably the most creative bit of it is that community sided focus is that bit where you're kind of in, you know whether you're embedded as as Claire Pro was investigative reporters were in specific communities, or even if you're embedded in certain views or values. I think you know a lot of the work we do, I do at Open Democracy, and have done for years, is about, you know, it is about a kind of crisis of democracy. It is about the pushback against democratic rights, whether that's changing the laws around elections here in the United Kingdom or access to information, and that kind of then embeds you often in a, in a series of people who might be different, who might be closer to to a kind of you know liberal metropolitan elite side uh, side of things, but they're also communities as well, which is interesting. It doesn't mean it can't be a community who don't have their own kind of interests and, and coherence and things to tell you that are outside of your journalistic milieu. But the one thing I will leave you on with this too is. 
the flip side of this for people who come from what you might call the kind of objectivity school of journalism, which I do think is particularly American, but we do have a British version of it too. I think it's increasingly difficult, actually. I think there's a kind of interesting tension there that people like us could possibly creatively pull out of what you might call mainstream media. I was struck talking to a, a long, an old friend of mine who works at the BBC re re um, recently enough, and he was saying, you know, it's really hard now because I can't trust what the government say to me. You know, I used to, and, and there's a and there's a shift going on. So for a lot of journalists, there is a kind of decentering going on. And there might be ways in which we could have actually quite creative and interesting conversations because a lot of journalists in their everyday practice are finding that they have printed something one day that they find the next day, a week later, a month later, a year later to be to be incorrect. And in some ways, that is a challenge. You know, it's a challenge that's already happened in the United States. And it's a huge challenge that's happening right in front of us here in the United Kingdom. And I think, you know, in some ways, pulling what we might call professional journalists in with everybody else and trying to have some sort of creative conversation might be quite fun. I think so. That's what we're doing here. Um, it is funny that all the hand wringing and sort of tech and policy solutions and for misinformation, we have we have a prime minister who would be politely called a, a primary source of misinformation and more impolitely called a liar. So <laughs> you could do whatever you want around that, but if that's where we are, you know, well, um, why not start there? Um, two things, to your point about um, objectivity school and um, how uh, particularly in the US advocacy journalism has been seen as um, 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 something lesser, some lesser form of journalism or not, not journalism at all. The, thing, the point that I would always make to, to, to our team, and you've heard me bang on about endlessly, Peter, is that we, we need to be doing advocacy for journalism. That's different from advocacy journalism, right? That is making the case for the right to do our work. And make it and, and do and, and the right to do it in ways which engage people and help empower them. Um, and there's a great comment um, in in the chat here um, from Robin, who uh, you'll love this question, Peter. Um, you know, how do we equip local communities with the tools to address local injustices themselves? For example, using the Freedom of Information Act. You know, who's who will do it for them? Well, Robin, you've come to the right place. <laughs> Open Democracy has done a ton of work on this, and, and Peter, you can put some resources in the chat. But we just had a we we just did a. a countrywide big consultation on, on this and, and fed it into um, to parliamentary committee. Um, Jonathan, I wanted to bring you in because you also had response to what we were talking about before, which we've now sort of massively veered off from, but, but please, please come in and say what you wanted to say. So much water under the bridge. I got no idea what I was going to say 10 minutes ago. <laughs> um, I've got a hundred other things that I, that I want to say, but I can't say all of them. I want to go to Robin's point though, because he's been very active in the in the chat and making making a lot of really good 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 points. Um, so yes, there's, there's there's two things I want to say. Yes, you know, all citizens ideally should be equipped with the tools both to be able to sort of critically digest the information that's thrown at them. And if they want to, to actually go and dig out information that isn't being thrown at them and use FOI and use all the tools which they, you know, currently in this country do have at their disposal. Um, and if they're not being fully, you know, respected as open democracy has shown, then citizens also need to be helped to sort of campaign to make sure that FOI is fully respected. But that's not necessarily journalism. I think to go back to your earlier point, um, Mary, I think you were, you were making this point, Nikki, you were, you were coming back to it as well. You know, there is something different about journalism. It's not that journalists are a sort of rare species or should be kind of exempt from all laws or all normal standards of human behaviour. That's kind of what led to phone hacking was this idea that it was like, really, oh my God, yeah, you live on another planet. Do what you like. You're a journalist. No one's going to ask any questions. No one, no one should presume to question what you're doing because you're a journalist. I mean, that obviously leads to some very dark places. But the idea that there are some standards of how you deal with the truth and how you turn it into stories which are meant to engage and entertain and amuse, but also maybe inform and empower, I think that's not something we should, we should expect everyone to have to behave. So I'd like to see loads of active citizens. I'd like to see loads of journalists I'm slightly skeptical about citizen journalists. I think that sometimes there's a risk that you blur the division. I think you can be a great citizen, but you don't have to be a journalist. To be a journalist requires quite particular sort of discipline and skills and standards, which I don't think I want to expect of all citizens. I want to be able to go out and shout and, and lie from time to time as a private citizen and make a lot of noise and and you know, let the values dictate the facts and march up and down, you know, Whitehall if that's what 
But that's not journalism. That's a different, that's a different dimension of my citizenship. And I think if you just don't think everyone's a citizen journalist, I worry that you lose some of the specialness of journalism, which needs to be protected and, and defined. But the but the well indeed and this 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 is a great this is a great chat this is a, the contributions in the, on the side panel have been great because someone in the chat said exactly what I was about to say which is how do you bring those active citizens together with journalists right so that and that's where the change happens that's where the sweet spot happens when it comes to holding power to account is you absolutely recognise the difference between those two roles and functions but how they how they um, how they work together um, and how they reach each other. And how they engage um, each other, I think, is well. It's, it's part of the business model answer as well. Um, so, coming back to you, Nikki, for for final thoughts on that. Well, I mean, I was just whenever people start talking about citizen journalism, I get, and even just what citizens should and shouldn't be doing, it just reminds me that first of all, just by using the word citizen, we're leaving people out, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then in the, in the uh, EU, there's there is often there's an even birthright citizenship, so they're like people who are country list, right? Um, so that's the first thing, right? But to expect that from everybody, I think that's what defines journalism is journalists do this all the time. This is their job. It's not a thing that they do when they have time. It's what they do. And to me, that's the fundamental difference is that this is what a journalism journalist does all day. This is what they have time to do all day. And the reason they do it is so that everybody else doesn't have to, right? Or the people who can't do it because they don't have time to be engaged citizens or because they worry about showing up to city hall and getting deported, right? That's why journalists do what they do, right? And so that's kind of my last, my last comment on that, I suppose. Thank you. Um, I am going to wrap it up there because I think that's a very important point to finish on. Um, the, that point about service, right? Jour journalists are supposed to serve democracy, and hence maybe we're going back to that to that first question of why is journalism failing democracy, which puts too much pressure on journalism. But the point about a, a service um, for democracy, for um, not just citizens but everyone who, who who lives in the country, who participates in society, who is part of society. Um, so thank you for a really fantastic conversation. I think Peter already did the plug for the, for the Open Democracy newsletter. Please sign up um, to hear more um, and, and please support us if you can and, and join us in many of, of the things we're trying to do to advocate for um, journalism and holding power to account. Thank you so much, Nikki. Everyone should get her fabulous new book, News for the Rich, White and Blue. There's also that link in the chat. Um, thank you, Jonathan. I thought you were holding a book that you were plugging as well. I was like, oh. <laughs> 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 they've all three of them found they've written really good books and you should read all of them <laughs> um but thank you all for participating today um it's been fantastic and i hope um many of you will tune in again next week <laughs>